Welcome back, everybody. Another edition here of the Auburn Undercover Podcast on the 24-7 Sports Network. My name is Nathan King. Welcome back to the show, everybody. Going to do a live edition of the podcast once again, like we did a couple weeks ago. Let me pull up the chat here for Facebook. So welcome, everybody, our Facebook audience um, and our Twitter audience as well. Um, And obviously, if you guys are listening to this on your favorite podcasting app, thanks so much for joining us. Also, we're going to talk a lot of basketball um, today, and uh, he was on the podcast earlier this season. Certainly a lot has changed since then. It's Mr. Blake Lovell. Let me bring him in the stream here. Uh, SEC basketball expert over here from southeastern14.com. Does a great job of covering SEC hoops. Blake, the last time we talked was before the Auburn-Kentucky game. (laughs) Um, Been almost a month since then, you know, three, four weeks, something like that. A lot has changed in yeah. the league over the last three and a half weeks. And I think the main thing is that at the top of the league, things have gotten pretty interesting for these final two weeks. It's funny. I see a lot of people who are trying to sort out what the SEC tournament bracket would look like right now. And I'm just like, mm-hmm. please save your time. Like, it's just, it, it's going to change considerably over the next couple of weeks. Uh, what is it we've got? How many teams that are at seven, seven right now in the middle there? And you've even got Vanderbilt at six and eight. So, uh, but like you said, the top part of this thing has gotten a lot more interesting. Uh, I think after Arkansas beat Tennessee on Saturday to where theoretically Auburn still controls it's on destiny. As we know, they're in still in control of this entire thing, but things are at least more interesting uh, based on the remaining matchups because of Arkansas beating Tennessee. And I think that sets up a lot more possibilities than we would have thought even a week or two ago. So obviously we'll start here with Auburn. Um, You know, they were, Probably 14, 15 games into the winning streak last time we talked. They're getting ready to play Kentucky. We knew that that would be a big result for whoever won. Obviously, if Kentucky had won that game, um, then things would be tied atop the SEC right now. Auburn head-to-head doesn't matter, of course, in terms of your regular season standings. Um, But it does matter in this instance in the fact that they've been able to keep Kentucky at bay. Um, But since then, obviously, Auburn's last two road games lost to that really hot Arkansas team on the road, which was a fantastic game in overtime. Um, and then they had another opportunity to make it I don't know, not overtime, that opportunity to win the game against Florida, but they lose their first game of the season um, in regulation. Auburn fans are predictably, you know, having their opinions changed a little bit of this team just recently. But um, I think, you know, it's just a little bit more of a factor of you've won so many games and now, you know, you're dealing with a couple losses recently from your perspective how much has your opinion changed on this team if at all considering still at the top of the uh still at the top of the sec standings still a projected one seed by everybody now you've just got a couple more losses that have brought you down back down to earth a little bit yeah I, honestly my opinion hasn't changed a whole lot and i think i was probably one of those initially that thought hold on a second am, am i overreacting to this whole auburn isn't playing well away from home thing And then the more I looked at it, I'm thinking, maybe I am because, oh, by the way, Auburn still has the best road record of any team in the SEC. And obviously, if you're 24 and three, that's going to be the case. But I I think sometimes we and I think in this instance, it, it probably has been something because Auburn was so good the entire year up until, you know, losing a couple of these road games that you have to find something to pick apart. Um, You know, I don't. I don't think anybody was going to look at this Auburn team and say that was Gonzaga of last year or, or, you know, those kind of scenarios. Like we were, I don't think any of us were expecting Auburn to go what 30 and one or something like that. I mean, even when they're on this big winning streak, I think you understand mm-hmm. they're going to lose a game somewhere. And, yep. you know, I think for them, it's like, yeah, you've lost these road games, but I, I mean, there was a point where I, I don't even know if we talked, um, I, I may have said something on Twitter, but it's like that Arkansas game, there were points where I was looking up saying, how are they even in this game? Um, and you know, they lose in overtime by four Then Florida, you lose by one. You basically almost have a chance to win. I keep laughing about it. that's the whole thing. Everybody keeps looking back at the, the replay from that. It's like that ball, that angle is just a little bit different. You know, that is perhaps a dunk for a win, but still it's like they're seven and two on the road in the sec. And yes, they haven't played well at Missouri and Georgia and places like that, but you know, Kentucky's five and four on the road. Um, I mean, it's just like these are the kind of things I think you have to remember is even a team like Tennessee, right? Tennessee's been playing really well, but I mean, you know, on the road this season, they're what, four and five? Um, So it's like, I I think this is just something that comes with the territory. 
where, you know, it, it's one of those things where like, if you look in and compare some of these teams, they're just, they're not going to play as well in true road games. And if you're Auburn, who's played what nine true road games this year, you're seven and two again, go down the list for some of these teams. And a lot of these teams that are good are, are still having their struggles away from home. And I always say the good thing is, you know, it's not like the Super Bowl this year where the, the Bengals are playing a, a true road game against the, the Rams in the Super Bowl. In the NCAA tournament, you're not playing a true road game. So yep. I think those are things you have to keep in mind. And and yes, that is something that will probably still be in the back of your mind based on how they played away from home. But I still look at it as though, to me, there's still no team that has two players like Jabari Smith and Walker Kessler. There's your number one advantage. Your number two advantage is, I think, just the style they play. and you know, the guards at times, and you know this, I mean, from, from watching basketball, like in the SEC guards have kind of reigned supreme over the past, whatever many years. Right. And it's just one of those things where at times Auburn's guards are not really unlike, I think a lot of teams that Bruce Pearl's had where shot selection can be questionable at times, but those are still the guys that are kind of going to fuel what you can accomplish. I think, you know, outside of your big two there. So long way to get around to saying that my opinion on Auburn really hasn't changed all that much just because they haven't been perfect on the road. So, yeah. And the, I mean, the biggest thing too has been the turnover issues. Yeah. Um, at Arkansas, I believe they had uh, 18 in that game. And then they had 17 on the road against Florida. Now, the thing about the, that was funny about the Florida game was Florida was taking so many transition three pointers that they weren't, they it, Auburn with the entire first half without a point off of their turnover. So they turned the yeah. ball over. They weren't really making them pay for it. Florida only ended the game with nine points off 17 turnovers. Right. However, all nine of those points were off of three three pointers. I think Appleby had two of them. They ended up being, you know, pretty big killers yeah. down the stretch. But yeah, it seems like if they can kind of get that in order. Um, a lot of people have been talking a lot about, you know, obviously Jabari Smith and Walker Kessler, one of the best front courts, not just in the SEC, but in the country. Um, but Bruce talked about it last week. You know, maybe there's an over-reliance on a guy like Jabari Smith. Yeah. right now as as crazy as that sounds i mean he had 59 points <laughs> last week between those two games he shot 11 of 15 from deep yeah. in the two games um it certainly looks like he could be turning the corner from an effective scorer an efficient scorer a guy who's your go-to obviously on offense to a guy who could dominate a game problem is the rest of the team obviously is not rising obviously because you're not going to rise to the level of a number one overall pick but they've had their struggles in terms of um shooting the ball and 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 turnovers but you know, as we move into March, like you just talked about, I'm glad you brought that up with the guard play. Um, Cause I think Auburn fans remember that, you know, without Bryce Brown and Jared Harper, they wouldn't have gone anywhere in that tournament. But the fact was that they had two of the best guards in that vacuum. Maybe they weren't two of the best guards in the season, but when the, the tournament time came, they were, they, they were maybe the two best, the best guard pair in all of college basketball in that moment. I think Auburn fans know that they have that capability this year. With Wendell Green and KD Johnson, you've seen flashes of it. But to me, at least, it seems like, like you mentioned, um, you know, their floor is pretty high because of a pair like Smith and Kessler. They're going to keep you in every game. They're going to be really efficient. But I think, you know, this team will probably be determined in terms of if they make it to the second weekend, um, it's probably going to be determined on how well these guards play down the stretch. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's what it's going to come down to. Because even then, if your guards aren't playing well, that's still going to even if Jabari Smith blows up for 28 points, that's still going to impact what he can do in a lot of areas. Because again, like you said, if, if you don't have anyone else kind of helping in that category, that makes it much harder because it, it can become an over-reliance on that. Because still to me, the teams that, you know, I'm sure we can look back at some of the teams in recent years that have made runs in the tournament. You still want to have that one guy, right? Like you still want to have that one guy that can take over a game at any moment, but there's so much more that goes into it. And, and I think guard wise, it's funny because we were talking about this um, on one of the videos we did on our, our site the other day. It's funny to think like the last, I don't know how many years now we've really looked at the sec as a guard league, but this year, I mean, I don't remember the last time there have been this many good big men in the league just overall. And I mean, it's just been, there are so many different guys, whether it's, you know, the two we're talking about in Auburn, of course, Oscar Shibway, um, you know, you just go up and down the line. There's a lot of different guys that I think you've seen step up in big spots. Castleton, of course, is someone else. Um, even a guy like Liam Robbins of Vanderbilt, who has not played a lot, but like since he has started playing in the past couple of weeks, like he's a big difference maker. And so 
He dunked I, on Walker Kessler. That's not easy. It's, to do. it's uh, no, it's not. And um, so I think like those are the things that that you look at. And yes, it's it's easy to kind of put your focus on those guys, but I think still the guards are going to drive what you do. And I think that's especially the case on a Bruce Pearl team because we understand this is not as good of a three point shooting team as he's had over the years. And and that's something too where you have to make up for that somewhere. And I think that's where having the speed and the the aggressiveness, maybe a little too aggressive at times so of your, you know, your top couple guards and, and how they play, but they're going to have to hit shots. They're going to have to take care of the ball. Um, because again, there aren't going to be any teams. I think that can match up with Auburn from a, a one, two standpoint of a matchup with Smith matchup with Kessler. And let, let's just completely eliminate those guys. I just, I don't see a scenario where there's a team in the country that's going to be able to do that effectively. And that's just my personal opinion, but but some team is going to find a way to say, all right, we can figure out how to do this to this guy. One of these two, maybe let's make Katie Johnson and Wendell green beat us. Like let's make those guys beat us. And can they do that? We've seen before that those guys can have really good games, but the consistency, and I think really the taking care of the ball part of it, not having those little tiny turnovers that may look small in the moment, but then you get into a one point game and you realize, uh Oh, like right. that was the kind of, right. you know, that was the possession that could have determined it. Right. So yeah, that's where I would look at something like that. Again, I think shot selection is combined with that too. I mean, you can kind of sometimes to me, like I know it isn't put that way, but you can define a bad shot as a turnover, I guess, if you want to, that's for the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, so that is the one thing I would look at with Auburn and say, if you really want to start looking ahead and saying what could keep them from getting where they want to go, I just think being more consistent in that area because those guys can do it. It's just the consistency part of it, I think. Yeah, I, th I think back to that Florida game. Uh, yeah. Katie Johnson had five turnovers in that game. Three of them were unforced. Yeah. Nobody from Florida did anything. Two of them were almost the an identical play, just throwing it to a teammate in a half-court set and just lobbed it straight over his head. Just, just a yeah. bit of an errant pass. And you're exactly right. You look back at it, and you get three unforced turnovers. Auburn shot the ball pretty well in the second half. You got to think at least one of those probably would have been a free throw. It's yeah. just a two-point basket or something ends up being a one-point game. And I think that's kind of – that's what's made things difficult for Auburn fans to, I think, digest these past two losses is that they were so close. Yeah. Um, you, know, you look at most teams around the country, whenever they lose a game, you know, sometimes you can just say it was an off night. You can just say, well, you know, they just weren't playing well. You know, this, you know, they go on the road in the SEC and lose by 13 or 14. Um, you say, well, you know, we'll, we'll pick it back up. You know, everybody's got off nights. The problem is that these margins are so razor thin for Auburn because these games have been so close. People are dissecting the heck out of these issues. You know, oh, did Wendell Green take a bad shot against Arkansas? Um, you know, talking about the turnover issues against Florida, because like you said, it is so ticky tacky, like one thing here or there, and they win both of those games. Um, but I think, yeah, I think it's probably important to take a step back and realize, you know, most, I mean, Purdue got demolished at Michigan. You know, like t teams, really good teams sometimes just have bad nights. But I think it is Auburn's defense as well that's been able to keep them. Obviously, they're they're pretty efficient in that area. Um, Auburn's games this week, and then we'll move on to the rest of the league. Ole Miss, missing some scorers. Kermit Davis likes to give Bruce problems, <laughs> and he's actually won three of the last five in Auburn Arena in that mm -hmm. series. But I know they played well against Georgia, even without those guys. Um Seems like the kind of game where if Auburn is able to is able to you know score at a, at a decent rate, they they shoot the ball a lot better at home. Of course, they play great defense regardless of where they go. That that travels for them. Um, seems like as long as they're not looking ahead to Tennessee, which they're not really prone to do under Bruce. They they haven't had many games like that. Seems like this is one where you handle business because we'll talk about it, the SEC title race later. You have to handle business at home. Like people are looking like we talk about these razor thin margins. People are looking at these finishes. They are just assuming you win these last home games. They got Ole Miss and South Carolina. Yeah. If you drop one of those, you're in the real danger zone at that point. So, but this kind of seems like you know the schedule sets up nicely for Auburn to have those two teams kind of lower tier in the SEC to to close out the season at home. Yeah, I mean, two two coaches that understand what Bruce Pearl wants to do though, and that's yeah. you know Kermit and Frank Martin, like they. They understand, yeah. and I think we... I say that, and South Carolina has had some good <laughs> wins recently. So, and yeah. it's, I mean, I was, I mean, I'm not laughing at South Carolina, but earlier I'm just laughing like, this is like the Frank Martin special. They are 7-7 seven and seven in the league, <laughs> and you have no idea how they've got there. But yet, they legitimately, at this point, if you do the math and you look at some of the matchups, you know, if they were to beat Mississippi State, I guess they play them on Wednesday, 
the math starts to add up where they could be the fifth place team in the league. And it's like, how many times have we seen this before where South Carolina could wind up fifth or something in the fifth, fourth or fifth? I mean, they're not going to wind up fourth, but it's like, and they still don't make the tournament. And it's like one of those things where I just, I still think that's in play. The Ole Miss one, I think I've kind of, you know, defined this as the lost season for Ole Miss, because when you really look at Ole Miss, look at how many decent to good wins they have. Like they have quite a few of their 13 wins. A lot of them are pretty decent wins. And yet, they've had no consistency because they've just had to play so many different lineups because of injuries and other things. And, you know, now Ruffin's out for the year. He was just really starting to make some strides. You know, Jarkel Joiners, he's been up and I mean, up and down because he's just been out in and out most of the year, you know, injuries and such. And you look at some of the other guys that missed this most recent game against Georgia, they still won, but it's Georgia. Um, yeah. So I think it's like, you just, you don't know who's going to step on the floor for Ole Miss. And if it's their main nucleus, I think there are there is a scenario where they can give Auburn some trouble here just because Kermit, again, understands, I think, how to try to counter what Bruce wants to do. But I also know that Kermit hasn't seen a, a one-two of Jabari Smith and Walker Kessler in terms of, you know, in this scenario. Now, yes, let's go back to that first game, right? I think we have to remember – Ole Miss was up, what, 14, 15 in that game, first time around. Um, different they scenario. They weren't missing shots. Like. No, they were making shots, and that's a team that has struggled to do that this year. I mean, they've not been great at that, but they were at least making shots. And um, so I think that's something that at least if you're Ole Miss, you can look back and say, all right, maybe we can do something with that. What did we do so well that put us in that position the first time around? Um, that's something you have to aim for in this game, but – like you said, I just don't – without knowing what even – what lineup's going to be on the floor for Ole Miss, it's hard to know exactly what to expect from this game. But you would think Auburn will bounce back pretty well, kind of like they did after the the Arkansas game. Yeah. Feels similar. You know, played A&M, I guess, the game or after that. And A&M and Ole Miss feel a little similar to me in terms of how they, they want to do things. So maybe a similar scenario there. But but like you said, I mean, that that's it. Like you have to win your home games because everyone at this point is just assuming you're going to win your home games. The yep. two road games are up in the air. But – um, you know, the home games you have to win at this point if you want to be the regular season champions. And and I think Auburn will at least come out and, and have a really good shot to do that against Ole Miss. Yeah, and it's like Auburn, Kentucky, Tennessee. It's, I mean, the three yeah. best teams in the league have not lost at home Yeah, this season. Right. Um, and they play a lot better at home as well. Yeah, it's funny looking back on that game against Ole Miss. Uh, Kessler had 20 points, 10 rebounds, and seven blocks. <laughs> and that was the first one where we were like, wow. What a stat line. Seven blocks. Are you kidding yeah. me? And now the dude's done it like eight times since then. Yeah. And we just kind of, you know, shrug yeah. our shoulders. That was an interesting point you brought up earlier about, you know, matching up against both Kessler and Smith. I I, I agree. Obviously, not anybody's going to be able to do it with both of them. But you saw against Florida, a guy like Colin Castleton. Now, he's a very, very skilled player. There's not a lot like him. But he had Kessler's number in the first game, too. Yeah. Um, and anytime you've got a guy that's able to hit the too small celebration against Walker <laughs> Kessler, that's a that's a pretty big accomplishment. Um, you know, it didn't it didn't take Kessler out of the game. He's probably still their second best player in that game, but he didn't block a shot. He had yeah. no blocks. And the only other time all season he hasn't blocked a shot was the Alabama game, and he fouled out of that game and had two points. So he was yeah. basically didn't even register in the rotation um for Auburn in that game. So yeah, I mean, I think probably it's more of a case of tournament time, like NCAA tournament time when you get to some teams in the big 10 stuff like that, that have these, these pretty talented front courts as well. Be interesting to see how those match up. I mean, Ole Miss um, does have a seven foot or two. I don't, I don't want to like, the that's Brooks true. Is, you know, I think that's something, uh, I mean, look, he's not Colin Castleton, but he's still someone that I think could give Auburn some trouble. So that's, I'm not, I'm not trying to worry. He Auburn was good in the here. first game. <laughs> he was good, but I just want to say 14 like, points, six and nine shooting and eight boards. Know. You, you brought that up about Kermit, and I, I think that's a good point, is I think there are just some coaches that, that understand the tendencies and find ways to match up better with other coaches. Um, yeah. And it at least seems like Kermit has, has done that. So we'll see. Yeah. And Frank, and not these last two seasons, so maybe it's right. no longer a situation. Yeah, but Frank Martin <laughs> gives Bruce problems. Yeah, Auburn yeah. scored like 111 on the road against South Carolina last year. They beat him pretty handily yeah. this year. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, this, Kermit. Kermit has given you can you can see it whenever he talks. We're talking to Bruce later today too. Uh, you can see it whenever he talks about it. He is obviously very frustrated uh, every time he goes against Kermit Davis. Um, the opposite side of that is probably how Rick Barnes feels about Bruce Pearl. Um, it's crazy to me every time I look back. Auburn has won six straight in that series. 
not just at home overall period they have yeah. won six straight games against tennessee you're talking about the sec tournament team in nashville that was like one of the best tennessee teams of recent history just yeah. absolutely mopped the floor with them in that game uh they won by 22 the last time they went to knoxville that was a pretty good team too samir dowdy had 32 points in that game um over the past few years what is it do you think because i can't i can't put my finger on it um what is it about what bruce is able to do against rick barnes that has made auburn so successful is it man no a lot of it's probably motivation he obviously this game means a lot to him um but yeah. it seems like just from a schematic standpoint he's he's had his number the past six six tries in the series yeah it's um i think it's probably to me is the tennessee aspect of this to where i mean really you know i'm thinking back to some of these games i assume it's the difference has been auburn has been much more consistent offensively than tennessee has i mean if we really think about what we always pick apart with tennessee is just they can be so frustrating on offense and i think even this year they've started to turn a corner but, you know, then they go and score 48 at Arkansas, right? And, I mean, I know that's that's a different scenario because it is on the road. You're playing a team that's I think has played as well as anyone in the league over the past month. But you still have those lulls for Tennessee, and I think that's kind of been a theme for Rick Barnes is, I mean, I mean, even go back to last year where this team gets, what, number five seed or whatever it was, I think, and you know, they score 56 points, lose by double digits to Oregon State. I know Oregon State made a run, but – the offense has kind of held Tennessee back. And, and I'm looking back at some of these scores now because I'm curious, like, does it add mm-hmm. up of what I'm trying to say here? And, I mean, last year, you know, what is it, 77, 72. But then you go back to some of the previous ones where Tennessee only scored 66 at Auburn. They scored 63 at home. Um, you know, those kind of games, I just – I think that has to play a part in it. And I know they, you know, put up some points in one of those games. But I just think that is probably more of a Tennessee thing to where – we talked about like with the, the Bruce Pearl Kermit Davis thing. And you alluded to it, like the Bruce and Rick Barnes thing is like, maybe it's just one of those scenarios where for a Tennessee team, that's been frustrating offensively, just for whatever reason, they, they get more frustrated when you play a team like Auburn and, and understanding the style they play, because I do think it's two different styles, right? Tennessee wants to win ugly sometimes. And I, whether they want to be labeled that or not, that's just, that's how it is sometimes with them. Um, you know, the, the 90, 80, went over A&M, like that's an outlier when you look at their season to where a lot of the games they played have been kind of those grinded out low 70s, upper 60s type games. And I think that's how they want to win. But I think when you I, – I still am of the belief that a, a great offensive team will beat a great defensive team. And I think that, you know, there's a lot of data you can point to on that. But I, I think that there is just – for me, Auburn is – been kind of the best of both worlds. The, the good teams have been great offensively and they've been great defensively. But for me, Tennessee is, I just find it hard to believe they've they have really hit that greatness offensively the way they have defensively, right? And, and I think that's what holds them back sometimes. And maybe that's different this year. I think this is a very interesting setup um, because, again, like you said earlier, Tennessee does play well at home. Um, they're a team that, you know, you kind of expect them to win their home games. But I still always have in the back of my head that, offensively i just don't really ever know what i'm going to get from that team and maybe that's been a difference in the series yeah in auburn you know just it seems like they play their best game on both ends of the floor yeah. um against tennessee they, they've had plenty of motivation to do so um that game back in that they beat tennessee like a week you know twice in the span of a week because they beat them in their regular season finale in that final four year they actually denied tennessee a regular season title in that game um, Tennessee was the number five team in the country, came into Auburn Arena. Then Auburn turned around a week later. That was a close game, turned around a week later. And I mean, that was Grant Williams, Admiral Schofield. That was that team was awesome. And yeah. Auburn just couldn't miss from three. A little bit different of a DNA here. Um, I think, you know, however they bounce back against Ole Miss, if it's a struggle against Ole Miss, you know, we'll see that they've been capable of doing that. Kermit Davis during that final four season held Auburn to 55 points at home in a loss to Ole Miss. Yeah. So he's definitely, like you said, definitely capable. Um, of giving them some trouble. Blake, looking here at the SEC title races, I'm going to do my best to bring up uh, these onto the screen here. Um, We'll look at the schedules here from Auburn, Tennessee, and Kentucky because we were talking about before the show. I think there's a decent possibility we could be looking at a three-way tie here at the the end of the regular season. Obviously, head-to-head, there's no such thing. You know, well, I mean, there probably is such thing, but 
in this situation, you know, they'd be seated properly heading into the NCAA or the SEC tournament. But in terms of handing, handing, hanging, excuse me, a regular season banner for an SEC title, there's a possibility that it could happen. Now, in order to do that, it would be Auburn going two and two, losing, you assume, lose both the road games, um, Kentucky going three and one, and then Tennessee winning out. So we're going to play a little game here, and I'll put up these remaining schedules, the remaining four uh, games for each of these teams, and you tell me what you think is probably right. going to be your expected record. So right now we're looking at Auburn. We'll start with them. We've been talking about their schedule a lot. You know it. Um, I think the biggest thing here is probably that game in Starkville. That's probably yeah. the the you know, on the fence thing for most people here. Yeah. Tennessee Tennessee should win the game on Saturday. They they should by all accounts. They're playing really well at home. Auburn obviously has hit a bit of a lull. Um, but I guess are are you seeing that three and one finish here? And and how much does that? How huge is that game in Starkville? Yeah, I think that's the best because again, I, I think you just if you go into it assuming that Auburn's going to lose one of these road games, right? You think Tennessee's probably the the better scenario for that to happen. But Mississippi State's another team that's like, yep. flip it, right? They play great at home, but they have been terrible on the road. And so that is kind of the defining game of this whole deal. Auburn goes three and one. They're fine. I think that's what they wind up going is three and one. I just, I don't have a lot of confidence in Mississippi State, but I think this yep. schedule is, and we've, I've talked myself into it now since we discarded this discussion. I think this schedule is more tricky than perhaps we think because of, like we said, the matchups and just the a couple of these games. I mean, like even Ole Miss and South Carolina, like they can be deceiving, as we said, based on the teams and their records can be a little deceiving. But I think three and one is the most likely scenario here. And whether that's, hey, you get a, I don't want to say it's a surprise win at Tennessee, but let's say you go beat Tennessee. Would it shock anyone if you turn around and lose at Mississippi state? Probably not just because Mississippi state's right. a team that, you know, again, they've played really well at home. So I think three and one is what I would predict in that scenario. I think Mississippi state is a similar kind of matchup for Auburn. Bruce Pearl talks so much about Florida's athleticism. Yeah. Now that can give teams a lot of problems. Uh, you know, the guy like Garrison Brooks is, is a good guy down low, like Colin Castleton. Yep. I think maybe that's a similar You've got Molinar who can take over a game at any time. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. A really high profile guard, which Florida didn't have, yeah. but Tyree Appleby became that guy. I want um, to point out real quickly like, the that Florida game. game. Think about like that's a team that what this year they've shot. I was looking at the numbers. I got to find it. They're like they 30. Were 30. 5 percent yeah. from three, and they go what ten of something. I mean, it's just games like games like that happen, man. So they were. Uh, yeah, they were last in the SEC in three point shooting percentage entering that game, and then uh, and happens. then they let's see here. Yeah, they shoot they shoot they make seven of their first ten three pointers in the second half. They end up shooting seven of thirteen on threes <laughs> in the second half, and I mean that's how they did it. Here's the thing though: was Auburn was not necessarily interested in playing defense on those shots, yeah, well, because they were just letting them best, go. In, yeah, yeah, they were letting them go in transition. They were like, oh. <laughs> it'll be fine i mean this it's is just florida i like, guess this florida right. shooting threes yeah i forget who said it this morning somebody on some auburn fan on twitter said uh who's who does florida play tonight uh, um arkansas they play arkansas yeah. yeah uh which that's is that in gainesville that's an interesting one that's an yeah. opportunity yeah that's an opportunity there to pick them right now but uh somebody <laughs> this auburn fan said i really look forward to seeing florida miss every three points <laughs> <laughs> you know, just go absolutely probably. supernova. I go three go of twenty five. Yeah. Yes, probably pulling Alabama. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so we're both in agreement here. I think that three and one is probably the most likely yeah. outcome for Auburn. But yeah, I mean the the home games are a little bit trickier than. But two than maybe and two is on. not as not as unrealistic as you may think. Yeah. No. Think yeah, yeah. Just between those three, between yeah. the percentages of a South yeah. Carolina being tough, Ole Miss yeah. being tough, and having to go on the road. Yeah. I mean, it's not a killer either right. two and two you probably have a, still a decent you're shot still at, in good shape yeah I mean, you're still you still could be the one seed in tampa right. with that yeah. so but it depends on everyone else we'll pull up kentucky's now here we go um i got smarter this time and cropped it out a See, little this bit this gets a little is, trickier yeah this is rough <laughs> this is hard and it's tricky like you said because of now but here's the thing is it tricky because d does it matter i mean right now you look at what kentucky yeah. did against alabama i know alabama sometimes just isn't interested in playing defense. That's the difference I would point out is that right. I think, and that's like, even the game on Wednesday against LSU, I think is tricky because I think LSU matches mm -hmm. up pretty well with Kentucky. Even at full strength, I think they match up well with Kentucky, but it's like, if, if Washington doesn't play, if Wheeler doesn't play, 
LSU is one of the best in the country at forcing turnovers. Whereas Alabama is like, they're nowhere near what they were last year defensively. They don't really, they don't really force you to do a whole lot of anything. So it's like, I think that that one can be interesting right now. If you had that, ask me who I think is going to win on Saturday, I would pick Arkansas. Um, I just think that anyone winning there right now is going to be a challenge. Um, and then like even the Florida game has gotten more interesting now because I was completely mm-hmm. done on Florida. Like I was just completely out until Saturday. And and even still I was talking yesterday and we were doing our videos and my, my co-host Chris Lee was like, you know, I think I'm turning a corner on Florida. I said, I'm not like, I'm still not there. <laughs> like I, I just, I yeah. can't do it because oh, I went to their win- board and one of the most liked threads was still, it, it said, we're still firing Mike white. Right. Like, and like, like it's, let's just be clear. This doesn't change anything. <laughs> to me. Like Florida is still a team that they could beat Arkansas tonight. And then they could go out and lose at Georgia and or Vanderbilt in the next two sure. games. Right. And I think that's the problem I have with Florida. So that hard, that game's hard to predict. Let's play this two ways here. If Kentucky's at full strength, I think they probably finish three and one. If they are without yeah. Washington and or Wheeler for the next couple games, I think there's a scenario where they finish two and two. Um, mm-hmm. I, uh, I think one and three is a long shot, but if, yeah, yeah, yeah. if Washington doesn't play, I, I think matchup wise LSU and Arkansas, I don't love those matchups for Kentucky. Then it comes down to that Florida game. But I think, man, I think two and two may be the, actually the higher scenario at this point. It's tough. Because, Out of these three teams, they definitely yeah. have the toughest. We're not even going to bring up Arkansas. Arkansas is absolutely brutal. Yeah, theirs is brutal. To close I, the season. If all right, let's just for for the sake of fun, let's say they go three and one. Um, mm. Let's let's go with that being slightly ahead of two and two right now with Kentucky. Yeah, so. I would probably I would probably lean that way as well. But yeah, yeah. I mean Alabama seven turnovers without Severe yeah. Wheeler and Ty Ty Washington <laughs> is very very impressive against yeah. Alabama. However. Alabama's just Swiss cheese sometimes and, yeah. and just allows that to happen. Um, I will say that. Auburn. Right. Ex- exactly. I will they say that something no I meant hours. to bring up. <laughs> yeah. Something I meant to bring up earlier was people are getting so hung up on, um, which rightfully so Wendell green has, you know, he's, he's more of a creator for yeah. this offense for Auburn in terms of his own shot. Um, he's been shooting. Let's see over his past three games. He's six to 24. Um, that's 25% from the field, two of 11, from deep uh last month had a similar funk he had eight points in two games went three of 17 shooting against mizzou and oklahoma again it was a bad defense the next game in alabama but that next game was 23 points eight boards six assists one turnover yeah. um he's a good player and good basketball players can turn things around pretty quickly so um you know i'll be interested to see whether some of these issues for auburn become more long-standing or if they're able to come home head on the road play tennessee come home, you know, in the regular season finale as well and kind of clean some. I don't I, I just think the biggest thing right now is for a team like Auburn to finish decent two and two, three and one. Yeah. Do what you can in Tampa. It's not as important to you as it is to like a Arkansas or a Florida or something like that to win yeah. there um, and get to selection Sunday healthy. You've done you've put in so much work. Ninety percent of the work is already done. As long as you don't implode, you're probably a one seed. Um, yeah. I think that's just that's hard for people to swallow at this point. But I think We've learned over the year. I mean, Baylor, they didn't limp to the finish line last year, but they were not right. super yeah. impressive at the end of the regular season. All you got to do is make it there healthy. That's yeah. that's the number one thing you need to do. No, no, for sure. So and I look, mean, I, yeah. yeah. We're going to look now at Tennessee. I realize that I'm doing a really great job of making it a visual medium when this is also <laughs> going to be converted to a podcast. Um, <laughs> so I'll do, better jo- <laughs> I'll do a better job of reading out the the last four games here. Um, for Tennessee, their last four games, I think they have a very, very good chance of going 4-0 to close the season, and that makes things interesting. Um, they've got Missouri tonight on the road. Um, three of their last four, or excuse me, no, it's split evenly here. Uh, so they got Missouri on the road. They bring Auburn to Knoxville on Saturday. Then they go to Georgia, Then they bring Arkansas to Knoxville. you got two bottom feeders on the road. Um, Auburn struggled in both those spots, Tennessee probably will too just because of the way that they don't play offense super well (laughs) but you i mean you look at this and that's that's that was kind of the genesis of my thought that maybe they could all finish 14 and 4 is that this is the way tennessee plays at home and the opponents they have here on the road this is a decent looking 4-0 finish for this team i think so too i mean the the missouri game to me is tricky because 
if you, it's it's like not even just the Auburn game. I pulled up Missouri's schedule yesterday, and I was just like blown away. When you think about how many close games they have played and lost, right? Like this is yeah. a team that our our conversation in Missouri could be so different right now. They've lost at home to Auburn by one, Florida by one, A and M or Mississippi State by two. Um, you know they've had some other close calls, A and M by three. It's just like, man, this game, this team has been close a lot of times, and and I wouldn't be surprised because of the style if this is a kind of a close, grinded, grinded out type of game between these two. But yes, you're yeah. going to pick Tennessee to win. Um, but then it does come down. To, I don't think their Georgia's got any. I think Georgia's done for the year uh, based on yeah, pretty much everything out. there. Um, so it really just comes down to can Tennessee beat Auburn and Arkansas at home? Um, I mean, if you right now, if you who's the favorite in those two games? I think Tennessee's probably the favorite in both of those games right now. And so, you know, how it plays out up until the games are actually played, we don't know. But I think there is a good chance they go four and zero. I. I think beating Auburn and Arkansas at home is going to be tough, but maybe yes. I'm just, mm. you know, I think one of those two maybe gets them. But like you said, man, if you just look at it, though, look at what Tennessee, they're undefeated at home. Kentucky's undefeated at home. Auburn's undefeated at home. They just play so well there, and they will be up for those games. So, yes, I think in that scenario, Tennessee has the best chance, I think, of the others to go 4-0. So that's that's the comparison point you have right now. Is you're saying, if this is going to be a race – Tennessee has to be the one to do this because, like you said, I don't think Arkansas has the toughest of any of these four, so I don't think it's going to be them. Um, although, if Arkansas wins out, they're going to they're going to have a good shot, right? So then yeah. it's on Auburn at that point. But um, yeah, so I mean, I I think Tennessee has the best chance to go four and zero of any of those three teams, just based on the schedule. Yeah, and so that would put I think. So let's bring up the standings. Here we're gonna do that again. Nice, nice visual medium. <laughs> um, that would put you had yeah, it's Auburn. We picked three and one, so that gives yeah. you a fifteen and three finish to the league. That would that would give Auburn. You know, if we're assuming, I think we said three and one for them, three and one yeah. for Kentucky as well, um, and then an undefeated finish for Tennessee. That's an outright title. Yeah, for Auburn. Congratulations. Fifteen and three <laughs> is really really good. Um, yeah. But I think that's why I think it comes back so much to that game in Starkville. I just yeah. think that I don't. I, I think Ole Miss and South Carolina have a really good chance of giving Auburn trouble at home. But not for I forty minutes, probably. Yeah. I I just don't. <laughs> I mean, Vanderbilt gave him trouble for a little. Yeah. Vanderbilt's really scrappy. Yeah. Um, and Scotty Pippen's a guy that's going to absolutely be a great. So we talked about Lee and Robbins gave Kessler some trouble. Yeah. They've got their stuff, but not for forty minutes. Not when Jabari Smith was playing like he is. Yeah. I'm interested to see how long that continues. Too, like, have we? Have we seen not turned a corner because he was like you know, the number one overall pick? And it's like, oh, has he become a good player? It's like, of course he is. It's interesting to see what happens here. If this yeah. becomes a situation where he has kind of stepped into a different atmosphere and is saying, okay, I'm going to start being a dominant player yeah. um, at this point. And a lot of it was kind of synthesized by Ole Miss, or excuse me, Vanderbilt playing a zone. And he mm -hmm. just shot right over top of it. That's exactly what Ole Miss is going to do. So we'll see. I was going to say, I was, I was going to point out, I was going to say that I guarantee Ole Miss is going to do the same thing. And right. that's going to be interesting. Yeah. So we'll see how, we'll see how similar that goes. Um, yeah. It's, it's, I mean, there can be a lot that'll change within the next couple of weeks. Like we talked about when we were on here last time. I mean, I know it was like February 4th or something, but that was still <laughs> only a few weeks ago. And I think you were like, asked you like your biggest surprise in the SEC so far. And you said, well, Arkansas, they're just off to an awful start. I really don't know how this team isn't putting it together. Yep. And now look at them. They could absolutely just they torch do. through the end of the season. Um, yeah, so. if you're putting together your SEC tournament bracket right now, as we started the conversation with, you can fill in one spot. Everything else is up for debate. And I think you know what that <laughs> one spot is, Georgia. And that's it. Everything else, don't be putting anything in pen because everything else is still up for debate here. So. I was hanging out with uh, Jordan Hill last night. He now covers Georgia for 24-7. He left the Auburn market um, to do so. He has not left town yet, though, and he was telling me about – he was the one who wrote the story about Tom Crean staying on Zoom yeah. a little too long, unmuted. And he was just kind of telling me some backstory about some other things that have happened to him. like, that's uh, it's not sound good over there. He also it's... told me the delusions that Georgia fans have about the coach they're going to get. Well, I would – We pulled um... Jay Wright from Villanova. Like, <laughs> I, I would right? be careful about expectations if I'm Georgia. There have been a couple of names I've heard. One in particular um, I think would be interesting because of his ties to the SEC, but um, we'll see. I mean, that's a, again, this is a discussion for another day, but 
that's a job that I don't think is to the level that Georgia fans think it is. Mm -hmm. And I think when you compare it to a lot of other jobs in the SEC, the problem, one of the problems for Georgia is Bruce Pearl's at Auburn, right? Like he's just, I mean, we talk about recruiting. I mean, you know, you're trying to talk about how great it is to recruit at Georgia, but not if, you know, Bruce Pearl's picking out your best players and other people are too. I mean, it's just hard to, to have success. So I think it's a good job, but I think, it's as good of a job as Georgia wants it to be. And yeah. that to me is something that I don't know. You just want a national championship in football. So do you just look at it that way or do you say, all right, basketball is always going to be number two. And, and we've, again, this is another discussion, but you can say the same about other places, I suppose, but still, I, I think it's a little bit different. Um, just based on what is it? I, I pulled out the stat not long ago since 2016. I think every sec team has made the NCAA tournament except for Georgia. And so nice. it's just like, I don't know. You, you got to figure something out there. So, yeah, it is decent. It's geography. And that's the thing is that like yeah. they're in the same spot that Auburn is not the same spot because Alabama and Georgia and football are not Auburn in basketball. But just talking about like recruiting and everything, they're seeing what Auburn's doing in the state of Georgia yeah, and the success they're having Bruce Pearl. And they're saying, we're right here. Why not us? We're in the SEC. <laughs> right. We're not a prototypical power in basketball. You know, why can't we do it? So that makes it a little bit tougher. Um, yeah, all the Auburn fans will say extend Tom Green. They're very sad that this might <laughs> come to an end. They were trying to start a movement the other day. They were trying to get the hashtag going. Um, they were saying, you know, oh, we saved Brian Harson. We can save Tom Green too. Yeah, uh, that could be more. Difficult. He's been good to them so far. Yeah. Um, when you're when you go when you look at the possibility of going one and seventeen in your fourth year, that's that's an okay. issue, I think. So. Yeah, and it's not unexpected either because we looked no. at this roster in preseason and said, nope, not, nope, uh, said this was going to be the worst team. Completely rated. Yeah, yeah, it's not going to be good. But uh, we've rambled about Georgia for too long, probably. Uh, we'll probably wrap it up here. Um, Blake, thanks so much for joining us today on the Auburn Undercover Podcast. Really enjoy talking SEC basketball with you every time you're on here. Um, let the good people know where they can find your stuff um, because you guys do such a good job of covering the SEC. Yeah, I always appreciate it, man. Uh, like you said, we we basically do daily SEC videos now on YouTube, uh, basketball, and so you can find all that southeastern14.com. We've got uh, all of our daily basketball stuff. We just started deep into baseball. Of course, baseball started now, and of course, football. Just so much going on in the SEC. So yeah, you can find it all at uh, southeastern14.com. You can follow me on Twitter at the Blake Level. Perfect, perfect. Well, thank you so much, Blake, again for joining us today. Thank you guys so much for listening to this edition of the Auburn Undercover Podcast. If you guys enjoyed the show. Um, please leave us a five-star review wherever you guys listen to podcasts. That's the number one thing that helps us out. The intro and outro music is by Beats by Mordecai. You guys can find him on Twitter, SoundCloud, and Instagram. Until the next time, uh, enjoy the game against Ole Miss, and we will catch you guys later.